going to be the husband of the woman who's going to have the Son of God. Imagine being in that situation. But they're humble people. Next, they're obedient. And we see Mary's response. She said, Mary, she said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. This obedience to respond to God's call. How much in life do we miss out on strictly because we lack obedience? You say, well, if God called me, Brother Dan, and he were to ask me specifically something, I would do it. How many times have you opened your Bible this week and read a truth from the Word of God that admonished you to do something or to not do something and went out and responded to it and put that into action? That's called obedience. God asks obedience of me. And just like I ask obedience of my children, it's not always what they want. If they're hungry and I tell them to come eat, they're going to run, right? They're going to come down and eat. But if I tell them to clean up their room, it's a different story. And sometimes God's going to approach us with things that are exciting to us and we are to be obedient to that. And of course we will, but then also God is going to come and he's going to approach us with something where the obedience is not so easy and it's difficult. Hey, Joseph, I need you to uh, continue being the husband of a woman that is going to be pregnant, not by you, and other people might believe a different story, and you're just going to have to deal with that. We see the obedience. We see Mary. Me? Me? Just, I'm going to be the one to, to bear the Son of God? And I wonder if her reaction had been different about that. No, I don't want it. I don't want to be in this position. Choose somebody else. How many times have I thought to myself, uh, it would just be easy. It would just be easy to just go through life the way a lot of people do, just kind of sitting on the sidelines and watching. I don't want to make a whole lot of ripples. You know, you put yourself into a position like kind of what I'm doing here, or if you put yourself into a church position, you, you see our pastor Salazar, you live in a glass house. When you put yourself out there and you put yourself on display, you open yourself up to so much criticism. You open yourself up to everybody looking at your life. And you have to ask yourself, is, it, is this obedience worth it? And there's been many times, I'll be honest with you, just in uh, uh, my own personal life where God has come to me and He's asked something of me, and I know He has. And I've thought to myself, man, can I just be that guy who comes to church and sits on the sidelines and just listens, and I'll do some nice things every now and again. Man, I don't want to step up and be a leader. I don't want to step up and have to follow through with some of these situations, God. I just want to do what everybody else gets to do. And I wonder if Mary had felt this way when God came to her. Man, that's an unbelievable opportunity to bear the Son of God, but I don't think I'm the woman. Could you choose somebody else? I mean, I'll believe in it and I'll be happy for her, but does it have to be me? Not everybody's going to believe this story, as we see a lot of people didn't. But she was obedient and told the angel, Be it unto, uh, unto me according to thy word. Paul, he trembling and astonished, said to the Lord, What wilt thou have me to do when God cast him down on the road to Damascus? The next thing we see in these people, they're not driven by feelings. And Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. The feelings that Joseph felt in this position, and we, we actually got to see that dramatized a little bit here on the screen. The feelings that he felt. The feelings Mary felt. The feelings Moses and Paul felt when they were brought these situations. They weren't driven by those feelings. So many of our feelings, so many of our actions are driven by our emotions. How do I feel today? And the problem with that is every day is different. You're going to wake up one day and you're not going to eat breakfast and you're going to rush off to work. And about 11 o'clock, you're going to hate the world. Right? Or is that just me? I get hangry. I'm one of those guys. You heard of that? Hangry? Hangry, is it? Yeah, yeah. Where we just can't deal with life and, and in a moment, and we told you about this a few weeks ago, this single eye, this unhealthy eye will be uh, clouded 
and our perspective will be thrown off and everything that we see will be filtered through this unhealthy vision that we see, that we have, this unhealthy eye. And this is where we put ourselves into a situation where everything in our life, all of the many blessings God has given to us, are just going to be clouded by ugly, tainted. When we're driven by our feelings, this is how we live. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, the Bible says. So when you listen to the song that says to follow after your heart and do everything after your heart, and I even heard uh, one of the kids at the school make this statement, uh, I'm just following after my heart, and, you know, they said this the other day, I'm just like, oh man, that's another movie, it's another song that we've listened to, where our feelings dictate everything that we do. Imagine if Joseph's feelings had, been, had dictated how he acted in this matter. Imagine. Imagine you're in that situation. Man, you know what? Maybe it is of the Holy Ghost, but do I really want to deal with this? Do I really want to have to be the guy that, that deals with the shame alongside of her? I mean, I'll be good about it. I, I don't want to be evil towards her. I don't want to shame her. I'll just put her away privately. And Mary had told him what the situation was. And maybe he even believed her, but he still felt like, you know what? This is, I just need to, to move on from this. And if Joseph's feelings had dictated what he was going to do, he would have never ended up being in the situation that he's in today, the way we speak about him. They're not driven by feelings. Next, they're faithful. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Hebrews chapter 11 talks about this faith. It's the chapter of faith in the Bible, and it, it uses this reference to Moses. Moses chose to turn over what he had the opportunity to, be, to, to have as a life. He chose to give up the life of Pharaoh's son, to go to the backside of the desert, and then eventually have to go back and confront the very people who he grew up with, to bring plagues, or have God bring plagues, and to eventually take these people out of Egypt. By faith, he did this. Our faith is oftentimes, uh, we call ourselves believers, and we, we trust God through salvation, and that's a lot of times where we leave our faith. Right there. Well, I have enough faith, God, I do want to go to heaven, but that's about the extent of it. Moses here, think about this. Moses chose to give up what most of us spend our whole lives trying to attain. For the sake of Christ. For the sake of what God wanted him to do. So that one day we would read the story of what Moses did with the children of Israel. Taking them out of the promised land. And we would be able to see and be encouraged and draw from Moses' faith in the Bible. Our, I've heard our pastor say many times, where does our faith come from? Much Bible, much faith. Little Bible, little faith. No Bible, no faith. If your faith is weak, if your faith isn't where it's at, it should be at today, you should ask yourself the question, how much of the Word of God am I injecting into my life every day? That's why these songs we sing up here, straight from the Bible, straight Scripture are important. Because they strengthen our faith. Is it any wonder why we get up each day and we don't feel like we're connected to God in any way? We feel distant. We feel far away. I always know right away when I'm in that situation, what's the problem? Dan, you didn't spend any time with God today. Did you open your Bible? Did you pray? Did you invest anything into the things of God? Anything into what we talked about last week? The, inter the eternal We'll go two, three, four days, and then we'll wait, and Sunday rolls around, and we just don't feel spiritual, and maybe we'll come to church, and we'll be filled with the Word of God, and we'll walk out, and we'll feel uplifted again. Where do you think that comes from? It's not because I'm some amazing speaker, or because we have such an, a, a perfectly amazing church. It's the Word of God that's being injected into you. But the amazing thing about that is that as, as Baptists, you know, 
one of the specific things that we believe is the priesthood of the believer. You have the same access to God that I do, that Pastor Salazar does. Every single one of you in this room. The, there is absolutely no difference between us in the eyes of God. You can go to the Word of God as directly as I can. We don't have to go to talk to somebody else. There's nobody in between me and God. I don't have to go to uh, uh, an, inter an, in an intercessor. That intercessor is Jesus Christ when I pray. He makes up the lack of, of my prayers. He fills in for what I make mistakes. He tells God the things that I really should have been telling him that I didn't say. So I don't have to go to somebody else so to, to do that. But this faith, but when you disconnect yourself from the things that strengthen your faith and then your faith is weak, what do you expect? You're faithful. Now, these are the different characteristics and we'll be done shortly here. But what will it mean? What it's going to mean is something that most of us don't want it to. Pain and affliction. Pain and affliction. You know, the most difficult thing about a new believer, when somebody gets saved and they get into church, man, they get excited. They get very excited. And it's always exciting for, for, for me, who's grown up in church, whenever I see somebody who's just excited about the Word of God, and they're just feeding on it, and it's all brand new, and they're learning, and they're asking questions. It's so refreshing, and it's exciting. And I was talking to my wife, and this was several weeks back, and we were... Uh, speaking about this, and, and we came to the realization that the problem is there's a point where pain and affliction comes because God does not promise us an absence of it. And oftentimes we think that because we're just, uh, well, I'm a believer now and everything's going to be okay. Yes, our eternity is settled, and by the way, everything will be okay. But pain and affliction comes into our lives. We see the story with Moses again. It says that choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God, rather to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Paul says this of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was beaten with rods, once stoned, thrice suffered shipwreck. A, day and, a night and day have I been in the deep, journeyings often in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen. And perils by the heathen, and perils in the city, and perils in the wilderness, and perils in the sea, perils among false brethren, weariness, painfulness, watchings often, hunger, thirst, fastings, cold, nakedness. Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of the churches, who is weak, and I am not weak, which who is offended, and I burn not, if I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities." And there's a couple other references that we won't go through here for sake of time. But Paul is saying there's going to be this affliction that comes. Mary suffered with her son. Living with the persecution that he would receive, she stood at the foot of the cross and had to watch him die, knowing the reason why. Imagine Mary in this situation. You're going to birth the Son of God. But she knows the end of that story. The book of Isaiah tells us that he was going to be beaten. By his stripes, we were going to be healed. She knew the end of that story. And if she had enough faith to accept Jesus Christ uh, as her son and, and be the mother, the human mother of Jesus, she also had to have enough faith to understand what it was going to mean. She was going to have to stand on the sidelines and watch her son go through this. And you, you understand the love of a mother for a son to have to stand by and to watch her son suffer. Simeon, this, the, the man who, was, who lived until Jesus died, when they went to the temple for Jesus' circumcision, he tells her, Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, and that, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. He was telling Mary, you're going to feel the pain of this situation. Our relationship with Christ will not be absent of pain. And as I told you, when you're a new believer and everything's exciting, what you have to watch out for is the moment when pain comes. That moment when we direct it the wrong way, but we feel like God 
betrayed us. God, I got into this thing. I accepted what you're doing by faith. I believed in it. Maybe I forsook my family. Maybe I forsook my cultural religion. My mother is uh, 100% Italian. New York City, Italian. Grew up as Catholic as you can grow up in her, in, in her church, Catholic church, Catholic schools, Catholic, she taught in Catholic school. And when she decided to become a Baptist or decided to, become, to, to, to leave her Catholic faith, it was a big deal. It was difficult. It's difficult when you, have to, when you betray your family, and I'm in no way saying that Catholics are bad or anything. I still tell my mom she's still about a quarter Catholic. But it's difficult sometimes when you have to go a different direction that God takes you on. By the way, is there ever any situation where the reward is worth it, where there's not going to be pain and affliction? In sports, what draws people together is that pain and affliction of the season. And at the end of the year, when they win the title or they win the championship, it's that pain and affliction they draw from that brought them to that point. A life absence of pain and a life absence of affliction is a life that is incomplete. Because so many of the lessons that we need to learn as Christians will come through that pain and will come through that affliction. And when God brings those things into my life, I realize, God, you're working on me. I don't like it. I hate the way it feels. But I know, God, what you're doing. We see these different people. These are people who had amazing circumstances that they were going to grow up in. But in each and every one of them, there was a deep-rooted pain and a deep-rooted affliction that I'm sure they didn't prepare themselves for. Paul could have just continued on doing what he was doing as a Jew. He had a pretty great life. He decided to forsake all of it, go a completely different direction. Not only that, but he was going to be uh, subjected to intense persecution because of his decision. And the New Testament, and we like to think of ourselves as New Testament Christians, uh, and a lot of religion and a lot of uh, what we believe today in churches is this always feeling good. And there is no greater life than, than living for God. None. I promise you that. And we'll talk about that in a second. But there's going to be affliction, and I can't lie to you and say that there won't be. There's going to be situations where you are going to ask yourself, God, what are you doing to me? What are you doing to my family? God, I don't understand this. I'm your, I, I, I've been faithful to you. I love you, God, and look what you're doing. This doesn't make any sense to me. I tell those of you that are new believers, if you're new to church and this is all new to you, I tell you, get through those moments. Get through those moments. Understand that it is God. Understand that God would not put anybody into an extraordinary situation without the necessary amount of persecution and the necessary amount of pain and affliction. It is part of doing something extraordinary for God and it, it just has to be. Mary was going to suffer knowing her son was going to die. She was going to live with this. And I don't know, deep down, maybe there was a part of her that hoped it would never really happen that way. A lot of the Jews convinced themselves and, and fooled themselves into believing that Jesus was just going to come back and be this great king. This Messiah was just going to be this great king that uh, led them into victory. The problem was this. They didn't continue reading the prophecy. He was going to do that, and he is going to do that. But they didn't like the part about him dying. They didn't understand that. What do you mean he's going to die? And so, man, when he was walking around and he was bringing on the crowds and healing people, well, let's jump on behind this guy. This is him. Let's lay the palms down because it's happening. And then he says, love your enemies. And they're like, what? Love my enemies? No, you're here to deliver us from these enemies. Do good to them that persecute you. Pray for them. This was a Jesus they didn't want to see, and so quickly, immediately, they abandoned that. God, I'll have enough faith 
to get it to a point where everything is going to be positive for me, but we go past that, and you know what? No. And how many times have I seen people in church who will buy into this thing, man, and they get excited while it's good, and then something will come, and I didn't sign up for that. I signed up for the blessings and the sunshine and the rainbows every day. God, I didn't sign up for pain and affliction. But my Bible teaches something else besides sunshine and rainbows every day, folks. God's blessings are greater than any blessings you could ever receive in this life. But every day is not going to be exactly how we want it. There's going to be the suffering. Now the reward. Look at me, with me, if you will, at Luke chapter 18, verses 28 through 30, or just look on the screen behind me. I'm sure it'll be up there. The reward is more now and later. Not always manifested by how we think. More now, more later. Luke chapter 18, verses 28 through 30 says this, Then Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house for parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come, life everlasting. This was important. Now, when it talks about leaving your your parents, brethren, wife, children, it's, it's talking about, it's not saying that you're supposed to leave all those people to forsake them and follow Christ. He's just using, these are the things that we usually hold most dearly to. These are the things that we usually elevate over God. Our, our families, our children, our wives, these are the things that we usually uh, put, put over God and we put him somewhere below them. But what he's saying, that, saying is this, those of you that forsake those things in your life that are so important for you and you put me first, there will be more now and there will be more later. Now, this is not always manifest, like I said, by how we think. What we think of as more now is we think, oh, God's going to give me a lot of money. It's a prosperity gospel idea. How many times have you been sitting up late at night and I've been there? And you're flipping through and you flip it on to a religious station. Most of you are like, no, I never do that. Why would I do that? You're watching those inf- infomercials, right? About the, the what are they, the, the stuff, the rubber stuff that you paint on the boat. The guy, you know what I'm talking about. You guys have all seen that commercial. But we say, and I've done this sometimes. My wife, she always comes, what are you watching right now? And it's always some, you know, the religious channels are always a little bit, a little bit goofy. Kind of like what you're thinking of me right now. And I'm watching it, and this guy was saying how, you know, I, I, God has told me there is 10 people in this room right now who are going to give a, I don't remember what they call it, a credit. i got to try this. I'm not good enough. I'm not a good enough salesman yet. Brother Gus, you're going to have to teach me some more about this. But there's 10 of you in here right now who are going to give a credit to God. And God's going to do something amazing in your life. And then he started talking about how people gave him like four BMWs and all of this stuff. And you sit there and you watch that for a while, and you're like, wow, maybe... I mean, it's just 20 bucks, you know, it's just 100 bucks. <laughs> it means I'm going to get a, this is what we think, this idea that there's this prosperity. It's more now and more later. That's not necessarily what it's talking about. You know, Moses gave up a lot to be part of what he was a part of. But I would say that if Moses could go back, man, he would do it all over again, don't you think? Sometimes, what we give up, sometimes we give up that extra job to spend more time with our kids. Sometimes we give up that extra situation we were stuck in so that we could be a better husband or a wife. Sometimes the reward is not what we think it is. Our idea of rewards, our idea of what is a blessing in our lives is so tainted by materialism. It's tainted by the world we live in, what we see. If my TV is not really big, then I'm not really that blessed, God. I only have a 55-inch I need a 65 inch. And we look at the blessings of materialism and we we craft our decision making based on that. That's not what it's talking about. Obviously, as I talked last week, this eternal perspective, what do we do each day? Every day when you get up, what do you do that is going to be eternal? What do you invest in that's eternal? You know, if we thought about that a lot, it would solve a lot of our problems. When I get up in the morning, what am I going to do today that will last? That's kind of scary, right? 
What am I going to do today that will last forever? Eternal things. It's not always manifested by what we think. It's not always the blessings that we think we're going to achieve. Wealth, money, things. That's not what it means. Maybe it means that the day is going to, at the end of, uh, when your kid grows up and you're standing at the altar with your daughter or whatever and she's about to get married when you start to understand those things. Maybe it's when you look down the path and you see how much time you invested into your relationship, you invested in your marriage, and you see the product, you see the fruit of that. It's not always manifested by what we think. When our desires equal his desires and we want the things that he wants, we have more now. Also, those things, when our desires become like that, when our desires become like God's desires, everything that we invest in becomes eternal and lasts forever. Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, parents, brethren, wife, children, for the kingdom of God, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come, life everlasting. And then the second thing, this is our last point here, is salvation. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. It's Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 27. Jesus asks a simple request. He says, take up your cross, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Deny yourself, take up your cross follow me. Most of us can't get past point one. Denying myself. I can't deny myself. I like what I got going on with me. But that's step one. And then he says, take up your cross, the affliction, your cross. Follow me. Jesus Christ came to this earth in the Christmas story, and we'll talk about this a little bit next week. I'll have a, little bit, I have a little bit more of a Christmas, I guess, sermon planned. But Jesus Christ came to this earth, and we love the Christmas story, because the Christmas story is it's cute, and it's fun. And uh, we've, uh, we've glorified it so much. But just like the Jews, we don't like where the Christmas story ended. Jesus Christ came to this earth. His whole reason for coming was to die. His whole reason for coming to this earth was to be put on the cross for our sins. A lot of the Jews didn't like that. They didn't like to hear that. But that's why he came. Jesus talks about this. He says, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. What is he talking about there? He's talking about what we believe is salvation. The Bible says that we're sinners, that there's a price on that sin. He says that, he's, that Christ came to this earth, born as a baby in a manger in Bethlehem, lived 33 and a half years, died on the cross for our sins. John the Baptist, we, we didn't get into him much, but he came in front of Jesus, and his whole purpose for living was to present Jesus Christ. They were very similar, very close to the same age. And all he did was go ahead of him and say, you need to repent of your sins. See, we don't think of ourselves as sinners. We don't, want to, we don't want to accept that because we compare ourselves to those around us in this world and that's not a good comparison. You might think yourself good, but in the eyes of perfection, in the eyes of God, we're filthy rags, the Bible says. We're disgusting. It is our sin that has kept us from God. And when he says he's going to give us more now and he's going to give us more later, the most important thing that you can receive is salvation. Every head bowed and every eye closed, if you will. Jesus came to this earth for one purpose, and that was to save his people from their sins. Like I said, when we compare ourselves to that in the world around us, we think of ourselves as pretty good. When we compare ourselves to the righteousness of God, we don't even come close, we don't even step on the scale. God understood this, and he knew that there was going to need to be some redemption, so he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth 
He was born and lived, like I said, and he died. And that was his purpose for coming, was to save people from their sins. The Bible says first that there's a price, that, that we're all sinners. There's a price on sin. For the wages of sin is death. That death means death physically. We're all going to die. That also means death. And the Bible talks about a second death. That's death in hell. Where are you going to be after you die? It says there's a price on this sin, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That gift is Jesus Christ coming to this earth, dying for our sins. That's the gift that he gave to us, the greatest gift we'll ever receive. And he says that to accept it by faith is how we go to heaven when we, when we die. We accept this by faith. The only way you don't receive a gift, folks, is by not taking it. The gift is yours. It's free. But if you don't take it, you never receive it. Let me ask you the question, and every head's bowed and every eye's closed, but if you don't know 100% sure that you're going to heaven when you die, the Bible tells us that we can know that for sure. It's very clear on that teaching. But if you don't know that, we would just like to pray for you. Would you lift your hand up, please? See those hands right there? We got a couple. Just right where you're sitting, we're going to have somebody, if you don't mind, just take some time and, and speak with you a little bit. But the most important thing that you will ever do in this life is accept this. Is accept what the Bible talks about in regards to salvation. The Bible teaches us that we're sinners. There's that price on sin. Christ paid the price. And we accept that to go to heaven when we die. If you don't know that, and if you didn't want to raise your hand right now, you felt uncomfortable, I ask that you think through those thoughts that I just told you. Understand that Christ prayed, paid that price for your sin, and find some time. Talk to one of us. Talk to me. Talk to one of the staff guys here. Nobody here will be embarrassed by that. Nobody here will think any less of you. This is the most exciting, this is the greatest thing that you can do in your life, is secure your eternal salvation. Now let me ask you this, how many of us are prepared for when God comes to put us into an extraordinary circumstance? Where is our faith? How much time have we spent with God? How much of this do we actually believe? We call ourselves believers, but do we really invest in it? Do we believe in it? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I just want you to think about this this week as you go out of here. I want you to ask yourself, God, am I prepared? For when you come to me, and God, have I been listening? God, I ask that as we go out of here today, you meet with us. I ask that we go to your word and we get your truth, God. Don't take my word for it or anybody else's, but we need to listen to you and what you have to say. God, how many times, like I said, have I not been prepared? I ask that you do prepare me. I ask that you have me ready. God, I ask that I'm obedient, absent of pride, and feelings and willing to do the things that you're calling me to do. Be with us. Help us to be spirit-filled believers, God, who love you and who seek your word. Help us as we go out here this week. Keep us safe. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.